This is Brad Graham, the director of Soldiers All, and you are looking at a satellite view of the set used to produce this dramatic film. The movie was staged at Fort Pickett in southern Virginia, about 30 miles southwest of Petersburg, near the town of Blackstone. The base was opened in 1942 as a training facility for the Virginia Army National Guard. By the end of that year, the camp involved nearly 46,000 acres and spread across four counties. There were over 1,400 buildings completed at the post, including headquarters, warehouses, administrative buildings, a hospital, and six houses of worship. For the three principal settings for soldiers all, an early war open battlefield, a late war earthwork system, and a post-war reunion, Fort Pickett provided the perfect setting for us. Not only were there large open fields where we could maneuver the troops, Southern Virginia is a well-known region for the timber industry, and we knew that we'd be able to find a nearby supplier who would provide us with enough timber to build the earthworks or possibly even donate the logs for the film shoot and then retrieve them when we were done. When we arrived for pre-production on October 1, 2004, we had no idea how fortunate we would be in that regard. Fort Pickett is a classic Army facility at one time containing over 1,000 barracks buildings to house troops training for combat in World War II. Your stock and trade is the weapon you're armed with. It's your bodyguard and your battering ram. It's your best friend. After negotiating with camp management, we were given one of those buildings for our company of reenactors. A dining hall was also assigned to us right next to the barracks and Kerry Drager's Cook and Carry catering outfit took over the kitchen there, feeding our prep crew of about 10 people and up to 100 when the reenactors arrived for training and filming. For crew quarters, we were given a wing of an officer's quarters building and were assigned a few other structures for equipment and wardrobe. For those who like to have the entire film company close at hand, comfortably housed together, well-fed and organized, the Soldiers All location was the right place to get the job done efficiently, on time and on budget. But the real story of the Fort Pickett set is the elaborate earthworks that were built right on the base. We were given several areas to choose from, and the site you see here was chosen both for the access roads that facilitated the movement of our crew, equipment and troops, and for the high terrain prominence that we found there. The specific location we chose contained a small hill of soil that had been excavated from new construction on the base. This elevation can be seen as the sprawling, light-colored area at about the center of the image. The hill was about 9 feet high and 200 yards long. After leveling off the top of the hill, we outlined the pattern for our late war earthworks, which can be seen as the dark line that roughly follows the contours of the hill itself. The Confederates defended the position in this direction, with the Yankees attacking from the right and moving from right to left on your screen. This was not only the tactical axis for the two sides in the action, but provided the film project with its main shooting axis, the Rebels moving and shooting to frame right, the Federals attacking and firing to the left. The salient that is so often referred to in the program is at the top of the earthwork. By the time this image was captured in 2006, two years after the filming, the point of the salient had been worn away, not just from the wastage of time, but also from the destruction that was depicted in the Union attack. This salient point is the target of the main assault by the Yankees at sunrise, and the place where Ben attacks after the initial assault has been stalled by the Confederate defenders. In his pre-attack meeting, he used an angled tree branch to represent the salient. The earthen log line of works was over 100 yards long and up to 6 feet high. Looking at it from the inside, you can see that a ditch was dug along its whole length to provide a safe area for defending troops to drop out of sight when they reloaded. A firing step, or banquette, was included for the men to step up, aim, and fire. A headlog crowned the wall, held in place by short right-angle pieces, like the construction in a set of Lincoln logs. Sandbags would have provided the same function, but we preferred the all-wood notched look and the security of interlocking the logs and supports, thus making the retaining wall much stronger. Those smaller end pieces allowed an embrasure or open space for the riflemen to shoot, 
while protecting the rest of their bodies from enemy small arms fire. As we move down from the salient, notice how the line of the fortification bends back and then straightens out again. This was to provide the defenders with the ability to enfilade the attackers, firing down the length of the Yankee buildup of troops at the bottom of the slope. This is the aspect that is referred to with such relish by the character Big John, played by Rick Miller, when he describes to the new recruits the theory behind how it works. So we got him in a nasty enfilade. Andy? What's that? Flanking fire. They hit us a ways to the left, where our line bends back, we shoot them from the side. Moving a little further down the line of works, you see the sally port, the opening where the troops from inside the works can quickly go out on picket, bringing in prisoners or the wounded or counterattacking the enemy. The portal was made by offsetting and overlapping the two lines of earthworks, thus masking the opening from the enemy. A large and heavy wooden door was fabricated to seal off the opening while under attack. Toward the bottom of the earthwork is a classic Civil War era artillery platform built to accommodate two light field pieces and with embrasures for firing canister down the length of the line. Two heavy wooden platforms were built to support the cannons and they can be seen as faint dark areas behind the line, positioned at an angle so the guns can cover the whole field in front of the Confederate works. The planking allowed the guns to be easily turned when necessary to fire at any area outside or inside the works that Union troops had penetrated. A set of traverses or interior walls were built to prevent the defenders from being enfiladed by enemy troops who made it inside the works. These were built at right angles to the main wall and were evenly spaced down the length of the main line, thus containing any breakthrough to a limited area. Moving beyond the main fighting area behind the wall, the banquette, the ditch, and the traverses, we can still make out a portion of the communication trench, connecting the front line to the defender's encampment. This was a narrow ditch lined with a waddle of interlaced sticks or fascines made from bundles of brush that zigzagged from the rear areas to the main wall. The final action to capture the earthworks took place along this communication trench. Beyond the works to the left, a camp was established for the defenders. It was from this camp that they rose, formed up, moved through the communication trench, and arrived at the main wall in time to open fire as the enemy was moving through the outer works and toward the Confederates' main line. We should move now to the outer defenses, meant to slow down the enemy as their attack begins, exposing them to the fire coming from the works. But first, let's go back to those works and examine the logs that made up the wall. Where did they come from? For 100 yards of earthworks, we needed some 2,200 linear feet of raw timber, and even more than that for the picket reserve trench, vertical retaining logs, frisee, traverses, and other features. All of these items were fashioned and built by David Roberts and his crew with combat effects. During our site survey, David and I discovered just what was needed. Within a mile of our location, an abandoned sawmill just off the base. The mill property was being readied for sale, but a huge pile of mature logs was stacked at one end of the place, and when we entered to look around, a realtor was taking an inventory. He connected us to the owner, and I asked the magic question, can we have some of the pre-cut timber you have stacked up on your property? The answer was better than we could have hoped for. If you're going to take any of them, please take them all. And so we did. Eventually, we moved about 150 of the timbers to our fortification and laid them in, four logs high, and each section with a head log to make the works complete. One National Park Service historian who saw the film told us they were the best earthworks he had ever seen. To appreciate the extent of the set, from the earthworks all the way to the picket position on the right, notice the 20-foot combat effects trailer still sitting to one side of the access road. This will give you a sense of scale as we move beyond the fortification and into the outer lying areas of the Confederate defense. To identify the other parts of the Confederate defensive works, let's begin where the Yankees first encountered resistance to their advance, to the picket line in the upper right quadrant of the satellite image. 
seven light-colored spots mark the picket line, the spots being the picket foxholes, or rifle pits, shallow holes dug into the soil, sometimes improved with a rock or thick branches or brush to hide and protect the guard on duty. These men act as a tripwire against being surprised by an attack, but in the movie, the guard, played by Mike Espenshade, is drowsy, and the enemy comes out of the morning fog before he can react. He is killed before he can raise the alarm, and the attackers move on without being detected. To the left, or behind the picket line, is the picket reserve trench, a long, shallow trench dug into the soil with earth thrown up to create a short embankment facing the enemy and topped with branches, rocks, or anything that would afford a bit more protection. During the raid on the barn, situated between the two lines, Andy gathers in his raiding party at the picket reserve. When we're ready. At a follow-up shoot, we fully stocked that line with troops, where post-effects artist John O'Grady directed the placement of additional skirmishers and the angle of the camera in order to seamlessly extend the picket reserve and adequately fill the background. Ben's plan was to make the picket reserve run back and for the Yankees to follow, taking the same route through the Abati field, which contained masked or hidden pathways to allow the pickets to move out and return through this thick tangle of tree branches. The trunk end of these branches were anchored in the ground, with their tips sharpened and pointed toward the enemy, the sharp, nasty obstruction called by its French name, Abati. Think of it as what was used before the invention of barbed wire, and you'll have the idea. For the attackers who made it through the picket line, the picket reserve, and the abati, there were still five more obstacles to master, not including the enemy's own deadly fire, before they could enter the works and come to grips with the Confederates. So next was the chevaux de frise, a log or rail laid horizontally like a sawhorse and covered with projecting spikes facing the enemy. Hundreds of these porcupine-like structures, chained or roped together, would present a formidable obstruction that had to be penetrated while under fire by groups of pioneers armed with axes so the attackers could move on. Then, where the tan-colored terrain begins, there was a line of frazee, the same sort of sharpened stakes in the chevaux, packed tightly together to hold up the attackers before they jumped down into the ditch that ran the whole length of the earthwork. And from the ditch, there was a 12 to 14 foot slope to the top of the wall, the headlog, where the attacking force could finally go after the defenders. Imagine all of these obstacles from the picket line and the picket reserve to the abati, the chevaux de free, and the sharpened stakes at the edge of the ditch, and then the ditch itself partially filled with water to create a moat and another way of channeling the enemy attack. And then the long high slope that leads to the parapet. It's little wonder that these late war attacks were so deadly and that defenders, usually the Confederates at this late stage of the war, began digging elaborate defenses whenever they stopped long enough to bring up their supply wagons and near enough to a grove of trees that they could convert into an effective deadly earthwork change in the two main characters and their comrades from naive but dedicated adherence to their cause to determined but realistic veterans that change is the rich and meaningful story behind soldiers all entrenched warfare played its part in that evolution the difference between the early war open field fighting and the late field fortifications is striking and it's that difference that soldiers all was designed to illustrate and that we've determined to illuminate with this study of a single image, a satellite view of the movie set for Soldiers All.